Now we welcome another dynamic duo to the virtual podium, Glenn Whale and Leon Erickson. Glenn is the author of the book Radical Markets and the founder of Radical Exchange, a social movement that brings together activists, artists, entrepreneurs, and researchers using information technology and market mechanisms to create a richer and more equal society. Leon is an entrepreneurship and technology evangelist at Radical Exchange. Glenn will introduce us to the plurality paradigm for funding network goods and illustrate applications to a range of network goods funding approaches. Leon will then detail the application to quadratic funding and Gitcoin. Take it away. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm really excited to present this. My thinking on all this has been evolving quite a bit as uh, many of you who are familiar with uh, the work on quadratic funding and on radical markets, radical exchange, uh, we'll see. In, in particular, I'm going to try to push sort of the some of the basic building blocks in a little bit of a different direction. And the reason why I think that is um, so called for is that we're in this moment of tremendous uh, possibility. Some people uh, see it from a longer perspective, from the way that technology is going to transform the world and the you know specialness of this moment. Other of us see it from a political perspective that. This is a moment when um, democracy seems to be coming apart at the seams, when conflict uh, that we thought was you know, gone since the middle part of last century seems to be you know, creeping up again, and when new technology seem to offer different ways of organizing the world uh, in uh, you know, Web3 being a leading example of that. Moments like this are what Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite philosophers, called moments of public freedom. When it feels like the patterns that we establish as communities might become the patterns for how we live, um, which are very rare moments in human history. The paradigm that this conference has asked us to take to address this is what you might call uh, public goods. It's the notion that um, individuals tend to be selfish and that we need to come up with mechanisms for coordinating those selfish atomized individuals to work in the common interests of the planet, um, human race, whatever you want to define as the broader community. I want to encourage us to shift frames a little bit on that. And, and this talk is going to be aimed at sort of thinking about how it requires us to change these mechanism designs if we do. So instead, I want us to think about net networked goods. So what do I mean by that? We're all members of a range of different communities. Um, we might be part of a labor union. We might be members of a nation. We might be in a church or in an ethnic group or in a particular cryptocurrency community, a company that we work for. And um, those organizations already partially help to overcome the coordination problems we have. If they didn't, we would probably be in something like a Hobbesian war of each against all. So rather than the problem being, let's take a bunch of selfish individuals and coordinate them towards the global common good, instead the problem is that we already have partial solidarity with certain communities, but not with others. Um, and we need to try to both delegate to the communities that already are good at handling public goods for themselves, goods that are relevant to their communities to take advantage of their coordinating power and to overcome the partiality, the tendency to only identify with certain sort of subparts of the social graph and to build bridges to other parts to allow cooperation across difference. So if the idea here is coordinate selfish individuals towards the common good, the idea here is to coordinate partial individuals towards cooperation with people who they aren't currently cooperating with, but might have an opportunity to do so. So, Maybe that sounds like a subtle shift, but I think it, it actually fundamentally changes the, the way you approach the design and the primitives that you need and so forth. So like, what do I mean by that? On the one hand, we need to move from a perspective that perceives 
sort of a list of individuals and the individual's actions to ones that perceives people as living in a network of communities and that operates on that graph and sort of transformations of that graph as the you know, conceptual primitive uh, that's dynamically evolving. Um, in the you know, individual public good perspective, we think primarily about incentives, about you know, getting individuals to overcome their self-interest to do something. In the, what I would call plurality perspective, we instead think about something a little bit more like Star Trek, which is people have attachments to these different civilizations that they're part of, different communities they connect to. And you need to find ways to build bridges across those communities to overcome their tensions. Um, and you have to fundamentally shift who, who's your client. You know, In the public goods perspective, the, the usual way we approach it is, we're gonna solve the global coordination problem. Whereas in, the, in this perspective, instead, there's gonna be a whole range of different communities, each of which will have imperfectly achieved coordination internally. And we wanna help all of them coordinate better and then help organizations that bridge across them coordinate across them as well. So there becomes a much more heterogeneous, multi-level, complex systems structure to, to the problem. And I wanna discuss uh, five principles that I think are needed to implement uh, this. The first is what I would call recognition. This is the notion that, that our mechanisms and models need to formally recognize the existence of communities intermediate between the entirety of the world or all, everything that we'd like to coordinate and the atomized individual. We need to recognize a diversity of community groups that are like a primitive in, in the design space. Second, we need a principle of subsidiarity, which is that on issues that are mostly or exclusively relevant to some sub-network or some community within the network, we need to empower that community to govern those things and not a bunch of other people to come in and to um, only uh, allow for you know, governance at a higher level to kick in when there are issues that have externalities and cross-cutting things across the community. So just to understand you know, the role that this plays, there's a fundamental notion in mechanism design from the individualistic perspective that's called um, incentive compatibility or uh, alignment, or th there's a there's variety of names that are given for it. Freedom would be an informal name for it, which is that you have the notion that when you're talking about a private good that is just relevant to one individual, that you try to track that individual's preferences. Once you acknowledge communities, you need a parallel notion, but for communities, which is that at every level of community organization, you try to delegate to that community the issues that are relevant to its members because it will be best at achieving um, both the coordination it already has done and uh, to pay for uh, subsidies for additional coordination that needs to occur. Um, the third principle is neutrality. This is the notion that we want to try to have some sort of a formal and unbiased mechanism. But it's very important to understand that there are many different notions of neutrality and that none of the currently understood notions of neutrality will actually work in this world of complex communities. So one version of neutrality is what you might, is what's very common say in, in the blockchain world, um, which is neutrality across sort of units of some fungible resource like compute or uh, coins, um, where every coin is effectively treated in a symmetrical way, or every transaction is treated in a symmetrical way. Um, that's one notion of neutrality. Another notion of neutrality, which is common in democratic polities, is the notion of like one person, one vote, that every person should be treated as equal. But there's a third notion of neutrality, which also isn't quite the one that we want, but starts to show you uh, what's missing from those other two, which is the neutrality in the United Nations, where every country is treated as equal. Now, none of these, no these notions are deeply in tension with each other, and none of them is quite right. What we need is some notion of neutrality that sort of op operates on social graphs and relationships between things that treats 
communities and community operations intersecting with individual choices and stake and so forth in, in a neutral way. The, the fourth principle is cooperation across difference. And I think that this idea is most uh, naturally highlighted by the way that the U.S. Senate works, uh, for at least for Americans. So the U.S. Senate, every state gets two senators, regardless of how big or small they are. And that's based on the notion that um, we want to have some sense of representation by these sort of correlated social communities. So we don't want to, just because one state has a huge number of people, if they're already coordinating well with each other, just give them equal voice to any other state because they're already sort of almost a colluding group and we want to get these independent signals. Now, the Senate was, you know, appropriate for that sort of a logic, even if not optimal, at um, a moment in time when people thought the main divides across people or the main ways that people would organize collectively were states rather than political parties or um, racial Eth racial ethnic groups or uh, geographic locations within the state or whatever. Um, so this is a very sort of outmoded way of thinking about that. But the basic principle, I think, is uh, exactly right, which is we want to subsidize effectively cooperation, even holding fixed any individual profile of preferences or information that occurs across social differences. Other ex examples along very different lines happen in uh, different social contexts. So in Lebanon, they have a confessional system where there's something similar to the Senate, but across religious groups. And in um, uh, fascist Italy uh, and many corporatist systems, they did it by professional uh, organizations. Broadly, the concept is that we need to find sort of graph algorithms that can operate that subsidize cooperation across social communities, that amplify building of consensus across difference and not just um, some profile of individual preferences. And finally, uh, the last principle, and I was hinting at this in the previous one, is what I would call adaptation. This is the notion that um, the set of social groups that's relevant is dynamic. And it's not just dynamic because that's the nature of the world, but because that's the design of the system. When you're subsidizing cooperation across social differences, new social groups are constantly going to be emerging. And those social groups are going to um, uh, change the graph on which you, you are processing things. So, you know, as I mentioned before, it used to be maybe that the main divides were across states, probably never was actually. Race was always critical, gender was always critical, but at least that's what the system perceived. But clearly today, the main divides are not really across states, they're across rural and urban, even within a state, across, you know, between ethno-racial groups, between gender identifications, between uh, political parties, between uh, people with different types of education, different disciplines, et cetera. And we need systems that are not fixed in some particular historical definition of what the cleavages are, but that adapt to you know, evolving social patterns, which are in turn endogenous to the system itself. So I haven't worked these out in detail. I'm gonna give one example, and actually Leon's gonna give one example, worked out in much more detail of how this might apply within a quadratic funding ecosystem. But I wanna um, show first that I don't think that this is a specific observation to quadratic funding or anything like that. I think it's a general feature of pretty much any uh, system that tries to think about um, public uh, goods or any, any, really any sort of cooperation, that this is a paradigm that shifts the way you approach it. So let me talk about the S process. And, and again, this is not fully mathematically worked out, but hopefully it's illustrative. So <clears throat> a basic idea in the S process, <clears throat> which we heard about earlier this morning, is that you've got a funder, and then there are people who are making recommendations to this funder that have um, various perspectives. Now, in the current version of the S process, these people are all treated like more or less symmetrically as sort of symmetric atoms that might be advising. Maybe you put different weights on the different atoms, but um, if you think of someone like Holden Karnofsky, 
uh, he's very interested in what he calls world worldview diversification, um, which is to say that he doesn't view these different uh, people that he might ask for advice from as being just sort of symmetric atoms that all giving him advice. Instead, he views them as sort of clustered into different worldviews. And in fact, that's just a very simplistic way to model them. It might be that there are a variety of different partial worldviews that are held by different subsets of, of the actors and so forth. And, and kind of what he wants to do is for people within a worldview, what you really want to do is kind of pool the information they have together, take some sort of um, thing where they all adjust to each other, and then you know, implement that pooled view for the funds that are going to that worldview. Um, but for things that are across worldviews, you both want to do some amount of that delegation, but you also want to look for overlaps where there are things that even under all those worldviews would still be supported. You want to especially uh, prefer those things. You don't actually want to just treat everyone as symmetrical atoms. You actually want to sort of take their views, both based on natural language processing, the, the preferences they reveal, the, the words that they say, and cluster those into communities and then treat things in quite a different way within community versus cross uh, community. Uh, similarly, this principle applies to retroactive funding. So the way that Optimism uh, you know, recently did their retroactive funding grants was um, to have this panel of badge holders participate in judging different community proposals. Um, but again, treating all of these as sort of symmetric atoms seems kind of weird. And like making a super sharp distinction between badge holders and non-badge holders also seems a bit weird. Instead, what you might do, and probably what they did do, is choose people specifically to represent different communities that we think should have a voice in this process and are relevant. Like, you know, they could be the Ethereum Foundation, Protocol Labs, Filecoin, Zcash, et cetera. Each of these has various different attachments. You might also care about, you know, ethno-racial diversity, et cetera. But the, the point is that if we have the right algorithms for thinking about community structure, we don't need to just like choose some set of people to be representative of whatever. We, can, we could actually explicitly incorporate it into the way that the quadratic vo voting algorithm is structured the partial pooling of sort of people under the square roots, and Leon will get more into this, uh, the closer together they are in social network space. Um, and this apply I, ideas apply, I think, not only to sort of pure cooperative mechanisms, but also for mechanisms for the allocation of scarce resources, like you know, IP, IPFS or Filecoin, especially. So you know, the current structure of Filecoin um, is focused on geographic location and price. Um, and everything else that you might worry about, the type of security that they're running, the, you know, their reliability in various ways, et cetera, is assumed to just be covered by cryptography or some, you know, universal protocol. And that works for certain use cases, but for many use cases that people are gonna have, they're going to have regulatory requirements. They're going to have security. They're going to have a whole variety of requirements that are going to go beyond just uh, the things that can be captured in that type of a thin universal formalism. And you can imagine graphing those things, having people get certificates associated with those things uh, that allow people to do a search over these sort of social network similarities or uh, affiliations, which allow for a much broader use of this distributed uh, file storage or eventually distributed computation uh, model. Unfortunately, this is very hard to execute uh, right now on the current dominant structure of a uh, of blockchain ecosystem because there is sort of an obsession within the ecosystem of making things um, highly transferable uh, across wallets. No sense of these enduring features that promote uh, social connection. Right now, most NFTs, for example, are thought of as these sort of just transferable commodities rather than as things that are attached permanently to people's person, what Vitalik is called soulbound tokens. Um, but 
uh, I think we can move and, 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 you know, associated with this is this notion of, quote, permissionlessness. But permissionlessness is not really permissionlessness. What it actually is, is permissioning by fungible resources like compute and uh, uh, tokens, rather than permissioning by um, centralized entities. But an alternative to both is to do distributed permissioning by the issuance of, you know, personally attached tokens, which create a sense of identity and therefore allow computation on things that are neither these easily fungible transferable things, nor are they some central entity, but instead a pluralistic emergent sense of community and uh, identity that comes at its intersection. And Stellar is an interesting uh, uh, thing pointing in that uh, type of a direction. And I think that the, in many ways, those things aren't that hard to implement technologically. The, the bigger limitation we have is that there's a certain conception of what Web3 is about that is quite prominent, which is associated with um, you know, the book, The Sovereign Individual, for example, this sort of instinctive feeling in the space that we want to be anonymous, uh, sort of not too much uh, ability to uh, hold anyone accountable, even within local communities, and that we are sort of want to smash institutions. Rather than that we perceive institutions, we think that they have limitations. Um, we want to help overcome their limitations while taking them, you know, the existence of those structures into account, help make them better at coordinating themselves and improve coordination across them. But, but hopefully those sort of ideological limitations are things we can surmount. And that's very much my uh, project. So I'm working on a book jointly with Audrey Tong, trying to flesh out this plurality paradigm um, that thinks about these uh, social groups and the way they constitute uh, incentives and individual identity. Um, and I'm both doing that for a book for a broad audience, but also um, working on a trying to build an academic community, a research community around uh, designing and building these tools and to build it into the sort of uh, technological paradigm and associated research community that we have in things like cryptography and artificial intelligence. So thanks very much. And to try to make this all much more concrete, I'm gonna turn it over now to Leon, who will talk about how this could uh, work in the near term in the Gitcoin ecosystem. Thank you very much, Glenn. In this talk, I'll uh, try to basically put Glenn's thinking around plurality and, and apply it to Gitcoin grants and particularly focus on how soulbound tokens, this concept introduced by Vitalik recently, can, can help us make Gitcoin grants more pluralistic. So for those of you who don't know Gitcoin grants, Gitcoin grants is a quadratic funding program for uh, public goods in the blockchain open source ecosystem primarily, but we have also, also cooperated with like uh, climate and longevity causes. And um, credit funding basically helps ecosystems to optimize the provision of uh, public goods by making it way more democratic, self-organizing, and scalable. Um, this uh, flowchart on the left is a, a depiction of the of the quadratic funding process in a very individual individualistic way, where you have you know a couple of individuals in the community, Alicia, Charles, and Berta making contributions to a public cause, like fixing the streets or building the playground. And then the match uh, that comes from a philanthropic institution, in Gitcoin's case, it's usually like the Ethereum Foundation or other philanthropists from the space will, will match these contributions um, based on most essentially on the square root of the size of the contributions that's, that come from the individuals. So what counts in these formulas in the end is the square root of the size of the individual contributions and, and these square roots come into an algorithm that will determine the match. So it, what this does in the end is that it rewards cooperation, even if the contribution that you make is just $1, like the square root of one is one. So you really kind of maximize your marginal impact, uh, but you can increase your cooperation by donating a million dollars, but that will only account for 1000, like the square root of a million in, in that formula. So it's, like in turn, it really harnesses the collective intelligence because it allows people to show the intensity of their preferences in a very proportional way. But there are some dangers to Gitcoin if we look at it in this atomist, like if we 
view the participants in this, the, the individuals as like atoms who are separate from each other and just individuals because that's not true, right? Like one obvious danger is that like there could even be like fake identities in this, right? Like I could, being like the devil on the right hand side, here, set up like a, a bot or like multiple bots who then donate to my project. I give them money, they donate to my project. And this way I could basically pump out like an infinite amount of the money from the matching fund towards my project. But there are even harder cases, um, like, I mean, very natural case. Like imagine like that my romantic partner and I had both a grant within the Good Congruence ecosystem. We could basically send each other like donations back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this way pump out like almost uh, like infinite amounts from the matching fund and, and same goes for institutions. You know, if like, um, let's say radical exchange has a grant and get congruence, for instance, like if, if like all the like employees and, and very close collaborators would make like strategically donations to get congruence or just because they like the, uh, to, to radical exchange and get congruence, I could really like pump out super, like get high amounts of matching but is that really the type of cooperation that we try to reward? I mean, the, the people who support Radical Exchange already, the employees and just collaborators, um, should, like, is that really the goal of, of that mechanism to allow these highly coordinated groups to, to sort of win the game of like getting most of the matching? And then same goes for nations. If you imagine we really have this global individualistic quadratic funding system, uh, Len described this recently quite nicely on the uh, Gitcoin governance forum, like you could imagine that if you had like a climate round that probably a highly coordinated nation like China would be able to convince its 1 billion citizens to make a contribution to a Chinese cause or, or force them to do so. And this way, you know, you square 1 billion. This is a match that like that project should get. It's like an infinite amount of money that we'd need to, to match that. And otherwise that just get like almost 100% of the matching fund. So it seems like quadratic funding really has limits if we have this like individualist global view of, of things. And there are like some early priority mechanisms that Gitcoin has experimented with and, and put in place. One is really just uh, tackling the easier cases, which is a grants verification score where we ask the contributors to grants to verify their personhood. So really, unfortunately, just this binary question, like are you a human or not? The couple of platforms like Proof of Humanity or IDENA, Writer.gd trying to tackle this. But uh, also we've experimented with a mechanism that Vitalik introduced in 2019 called Pairwise Coordination Subsidies. It's basically just a new quadratic funding design where you can do the calculations uh, based on, on two pairs who donate to the same grant. So suppose that Glenn and I both made a contribution, like a donation as part of the Gitcoin Grants program to an IPFS grant. So in that case, like we we just look at isolated like blends, like you see the square root of C and then Leon to IPFS, like this would be my uh, contribution to IPFS. We take the square root of that contribution, multiply it with the square root of Glenn's contribution and take it times two. We could basically, all the pairs of participants that donate to IPFS could be listed in that way. We add up all these pairwise matches and this is the total match that IPFS would get. But now we have a cool opportunity to basically adjust the matching weight K for any of the pair of agents given evidence, let's call it evidence A, of how much they already cooperate. And now the question is like, how do we define A and how can we use it? So basically, if, if we have evidence that like two people are like highly coordinated, let's say people who live in a romantic relationship, we could basically give them a A value of one, like 100%. And if you look at how we compute the K value, like there would be one minus one. So the K value would be zero and the pairwise match for that pair of people who both contribute to, to the same project would be zero. So it's basically like putting them into the same square root. But as K could be like anything between zero and one, we could also have like a, something in between, like putting people into the same square root or having them in separate so square roots, which is, Pretty cool, and let's let's see how we could make these quantifications of A, basically the social distance or closeness that two agents have in quadratic funding. So imagine we had like a journal protocol that is bound to to people's souls. Let's say like we have Glenn's journal 
and, and Leon's journal that would record all kinds of attestations about ourselves, like describing what communities we interact with, what our interests are, what experiences we had, where, where we are, and all these type of information. So in Len's journal, we could, for instance, have the information is like based in the US, while Leon is based in Germany. Um, and, and these NFTs could be, you know, coming, all, all these attestations could come from um, either our location based on IP, but they could also come from um, even nation states could issue these, right? Like, like issue attestations like this person is a citizen of that country in, in this year or something along these lines. And then we could have both an NFT or an attestation issued by Radical Exchange if we're active members. It could obviously also be more granular where Glenn is the founder of Radical Exchange, maybe could have like a higher weight on that one than I, who is just like a member, evangelist and fanboy. But this is like an obvious overlap now. So we could basically say, um, okay, they share one attestation. They're both part of the Radical Exchange community. And then we have a third data point. Glenn works with Microsoft and stage job and Leon works with Gitcoin and stage job. So how can we like um, algorithmically try to try to match that with a pairwise matching formula? So if we want to compute A, and, and this is like obviously an algorithm that we could play around with and change, but one example of doing this in this very simple use case would be we just take the number of shared attestations over the mean of total attestations. So the mean of total attestations in this case, like Glenn has three attestations in his journal, Leon has three, but you need to imagine that like once we scale this and have this running for years, like we could have hundreds of thousands of these attestations proving facts about ourselves. Um, but in this case, okay, we have one shared attestation, which is one and two um, that we don't share. Like, so it's one over three and we, are basically coordinated or altruistic to our world to each other in like one third. And if we tie that back into the K values, like the K value of Glenn and Leon, when they donate to, to the same project in the same periodic funding program, um, would be one minus one third, so two thirds. So we'll basically decrease the match by one third. Um, and in this way, kind of account for the social closeness that that Glenn and I naturally have and and consider that we you know intrinsically strategically care about radical exchange and and both already cooperate to towards radical exchange causes all the time I mean like today having this presentation um, but but this could be way richer you can imagine that like you know we have all like hundreds of thousands of entries and then the administrators of these quadratic funding programs or other like institutions could really also select like we only trust these types of attestations and really ignore the rest. Like there's not going to be one size fits all algorithm, but many kinds depending on the needs of the uh, yeah social process that we you are organizing. And and these attestations uh, would essentially be like we, we can put these attestations into practice by uh, using that concept that Vitalik introduced called Sobon tokens, which are basically just like non-transferable attestations or NFTs, could be like any kind of object really um, on, on a computer. And, and the idea would basically that, that you would have one account that is linked to your like personhood. Like we could do this probably with proof of humanity, which is at this scale, uh, like makes it very hard for somebody to to create uh, multiple accounts, but uh, future will tell if it scales up to like billions of participants. But so far they have like ten thousand identities or fifteen thousand or so signed up, and we could you know get people to tie a soulbound journal to their proof of humanity account. So it's pretty obvious that they only have one, and then they could collect all these non-transferable attestations about themselves through POAPs or Ethereum attestation service type objects. And then we could really build up these like rich journals that, that prove who we are in a way and what communities we belong to and, and which people we trust. And the goal of this to get a you know, social graph that really reflects uh, the richness of all the intersections that, that people share, like Len and I share the intersection that we you know, both um, participated in, in the Protocol Labs event today that both of us participate in the Radical Exchange event in, in 2019 in Berlin. Both of us are Radical Exchange enthusiasts. And, and we could really map that out across kind of society, like all these 
community belongings and memberships. And um, here's a uh, yeah example of how such a social graph could could look like in the end. Um, and and the interesting observation is that there's this like um, interesting trade-off between individuals like basically claiming as many attestations as they can, but at the same time, all of these attestations that they claim uh, would would also like come as a liability whenever they like we we compute how much they cooperate with somebody. So consider this graph being like a representation of uh, Bitcoin grants programs. So we could have a program on blockchain technology more general, like like funding program for where any blockchain project could apply to receive funding. One focused on the IPFS ecosystem, one focused on the open source ecosystem, more generally one on the Linux ecosystem, Ethereum and so forth. And now you, you could imagine like a, a flow where when, when I want to make contributions in this way vote on the matching fund, let's say in the Ethereum ecosystem, I would first need to claim that attestation that, that then comes to my soulbound journal. And whenever I've claimed that attestation, I can, like I, I would gain voting rights in the Ethereum program on, on Gitcoin grants. Now, if I were to participate, say a week later, in the general like blockchain quadratic funding program for um, of Bitcoin, this would like this Ethereum attestation would obviously be part of my um, Solbon journal, which the administrators of the Bitcoin grants program could could use to to as evidence in the pairwise matching uh, calculations. So it's kind of this interesting trade-off where like you can get the right to, to participate in the Ethereum um, community, for example. But if you do that, this like participation will almost become like a part of your body in Web3, right? Like a part of your personality that you can't really get rid of. And, and that, I mean, then when you want to participate in the blockchain ecosystem, you give Gitcoin or the administrators of Bitcoin grants a right to to query that information about you so they can check how much you already cooperate with other people in the Ethereum ecosystem. And, and some cool, like just, I think like an powerful example of why this is so amazing might be that, you know, if we had this like generalized blockchain program, but we had all this information about whether people are rather, you know, coming from the NFT community or the Ethereum community or the IPFS community. The cool thing is that imagine that like, like with this algorithm, the grants that get the highest matching are the grants which are unifying across crypto communities. You know, like we we'll give higher weight to the grants that or higher matching to the grants that had support from both the Bitcoin, Ethereum and Solana community, like the, the ones that benefit the ecosystem holistically. And if we didn't do that, probably just because the Ethereum community is the largest at this point, the Ethereum could basically the Ethereum community could probably, you know, like move all of the matching funding available to Ethereum causes if we did not have the, the pairwise matching formula and, and the attestations about, you know, belonging to the Ethereum community. But if we account for that, we can really algorithmically discount, you know, donations that, that come from the Ethereum community towards Ethereum projects and, uh, just match like put high matching to the projects that have um support across ecosystems you know and and in the end we get cooperation across difference um so this could really you know scale to all kinds of institutions even outside of crypto you know you, you could imagine that like um any you know operator of a collective decision or asset would assess um, the soulbound journals of the applicants who want to participate in, in their decisions, then either like these like attestations that give you the right to participate in the first place could be um, free to claim, or you would need to prove like certain relationships with um, members of that institution or, or institutions that are close to the institution and really like make custom requirements that are relevant to the context of their like organization. And in this way, like given all the richness of information that they have about the 
participants distribute rights and responsibilities in a very like algorithmic way and and very like precise way you know where you where you value cooperation across difference and and mute kind of cooperation within existing eco chambers because obviously these existing like groups of people who already cooperate don't need much more incentive to to cooperate with each other and um basically it would be super cool you know if we had this standard of soulbound journals with all these attestations and and any like institution could just query these journals to to distribute rights and responsibilities in their in their um institutions um besides collective decisions i think one one interesting like other examples like assets that you know based on how distant you are to an institution you could increase or decrease the tax rate that 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 these uh, individuals have to pay for for using your assets stuff like that and and i guess there are many more like uh, social applications of of this that we can't even imagine yet you you could also use it you know to sort content in in social media or to reward people who who produce content in social media I guess really the sky is the limit um so what are some of the the next steps um we could you know experiment with more complex pairwise quadratic funding algorithms in git congruence um in the beginning we could probably just um do the calculations without actually issuing the attestations and just seeing like how the results would change which would i think already be an interesting insight and signal into which of the grants have support from you know people across different ecosystems within the bigger like gitcoin ecosystem and and we could also um then the next big step i guess is to standardize these soulbound journals so they can interoperate with like all kinds of institutions i uh, I can certainly see like how the, how these journals could be built on top of Ethereum, on top of like a rollup on Ethereum, on top of IPFS or Ceramic. Obviously, these journals would need to be like uh, highly accountable and um, private, ideally. And and in the best case, you know the the controller of that. You know, I I would only give like zero knowledge access to any institution that wants to uh, check to what communities I belong. And, and I think by now we have all like the cryptographic tools to really like build and scale um, such a private accountable soulbound journal um, in the next couple of months or so. And I, and I hope we, we get somebody to experiment with this. Um, and, and then like whenever we have these journals, we could really help all kinds of ecosystems to, to adopt these journals and experiment with related algorithms and, and bring democracy to Web3. Like right now, most of the, as Len said, like um, social systems in Web3 are per, like permissionless, where like only, you know, computational power or like fungible uh, power as like Ether or other assets give you access to, to power. But uh, this way we could really bring all these interesting mechanisms like quadratic funding, quadratic voting, partial common ownership to, to, to the crypto ecosystem at scale while maintaining decentralization, you know, that we wouldn't need to rely on one issuer on, of identity, but could actually, you know, do the identity piece in a very decentralized way. And at the same time, use that decentralized journal of, you know, identities to, to scale plurality and, in the space. Um, so please feel free to discuss uh, these ideas or if you have ideas how we can standardize these journals on gov.gitcoin.co, which is like the governance forum of Gitcoin. And also you can check out pluriverse.world, which is like a, a collaborative pledge uh, towards plurality in Web3. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, collaborate on, on this. Thank you for your attention.